that the very first session like this I ever went to, 1975, there was an American that had been brought across to the UK to tell us about empirical evidence about what made a difference in teaching in higher education. And one of the things he told us is that the most successful students sit at the front. <laughs> <laughs> he then showed a complete misunderstanding both of correlation and logistics by suggesting that students should sit at the front. Okay. We're in a very curious position in higher education at the moment. We've had the Labour Party, for heaven's sake, commissioning Lord Brown to turn higher education into a market driven by performance indicators about teaching quality, and this was somehow going to magically, and I quote, drive up quality. That's the logic of it. You then have Conservatives and Liberal Democrats, completely against Liberal Democratic perhaps, convictions, implement the Brown report, which is the Labour's idea, without there being a white paper. So it's never been discussed in Parliament. We're now in a situation where we have something that vaguely resembling a market. It actually is driven by performance indicators, National Student Survey, KIS, and other ones that we have no control over, like the newspapers, league tables. So we're in a very curious position. At the time this was going on, there were international comparative studies coming out. See, I'm going to take my jacket off. International comparative studies coming out saying rather curious things that uh, people in Britain didn't want to hear. For example, uh, British students work fewer hours than any other students in Europe by some considerable margin. There are some whole subject areas like media studies in Britain where the average number of student working hours in a year is so low that students would have to study for nine years to reach the Bologna definition of a bachelor's program. So we're not talking about small differences here. And the QAA, bless their cotton socks, said this didn't matter, it was the quality that mattered. Well, they were wrong. There's good evidence that they were wrong. The National Union of Students started banging on about what we want is more class contact hours. Well, actually, they're wrong about that as well. There's no evidence that increasing class contact hours improves student learning gains. Not only that, but those institutions that have tried to get better KIS data on class contact hours, the only way you can do it if you have a fixed number of students, a fixed budget, and a fixed number of teachers is to increase class size. So you can increase the number of classes students have, but only by increasing class size. And then when we do have evidence that increased class sizes are a negative predictor of quality. So if you actually respond to the performance indicator, things are going to get worse, not better. At this point, people were starting to get a little bit nervous about the rationale about all this. And I was commissioned to write a report, Dimensions of Quality, to try and remind the QAA, the NUS, and various others which variables actually mattered. What we knew about which are the things that actually made a difference to how much students learnt in higher education. And that got some attention very quickly. I got a letter from David Willett straight away, and I've been seeing him every so often ever since, because if they've got a system that's got the wrong performance indicators, it's going to drive down quality, and that would be somewhat embarrassing, especially if you're a um, political party that believes in markets. So they're concerned about that. Then the issue is, well, how are, how are universities responding to this? Well, the answer is, there's a lot of response. There's an enormous amount, some of it knee-jerk, some of it well thought out. And some universities that were sleepy old places have shot up the rankings and their performance indicators look much better than they did five years ago. Other places that you would have expected to do well have actually gradually slipped down the rankings of other people who have overtaken them. So institutions are behaving differently in this environment. They're paying attention to different things, and they're paying attention in different ways. So I was commissioned a second time to find out what's going on, to visit pro vice chancellors, quality, and institutions, and try and understand what kinds of efforts to make to get better in the market are being successful and which ones are not. And that's what this talk is about, These, those two things together. Until um, KIS came out and rankings based on the National Student Survey, all the league tables 
by and large, were based on variables that are about what's going on in a university before the students turn up, how rich they are, what the student A-level grades were, the research performance of the staff, how much money is spent on libraries. So there's all that <coughs> stuff, which in the literature is called pressage variables. Before you start looking at how teaching is actually conducted, what can you see in the environment? And if you believe those league tables, then you'd have to also believe that the pressage variables are the ones you should pay attention to, that they predict how much students learn. Well, the answer is the opposite. Most of these pressage variables tell you very, very little about what actually goes on. It helps to have more money because it enables you to do some of the things that actually do make a difference. But people with, who are rich don't necessarily spend their money like that. To give a non-UK example, um, students at Yale in the States, $42,000 a year fees, those students are unlikely to get any feedback from a tenured academic until their third year. They get it all from graduate teaching assistants until then. So Yale does not spend its riches on teaching undergraduates. There's a wonderful public self-examination by Harvard to hit the front page of the New York Times in which a student was quoted in big letters, one of those blocks in the middle of the front page of the New York Times, that said, well, you wouldn't go to Harvard for the teaching, would you? So money doesn't necessarily do the job. It, ma it matters what you do with the money. There's lots of evidence that there are institutions with the same retention rates, one of which spends twice as much per student as the other. Studies that show that institutions that spend the same amount of money, one has twice the retention of the other. You can, however you look at it, there's an enormous amount of scope for spending your money differently. When I was doing this review, I got um, the HEA to put various different national databases together, because in the UK all the information is separate at the moment, and discovered that how much money an institution spends on learning resources is a really good predictor of how hard students work. So there are things there that matter. So the librarians here, the, the news is good. Selectivity, how selective you are. That's in, that was in the Times, Guardian, <coughs> Telegraph League table, so the Witch League table. It predicts degree classification because the best students coming in are the same as the best students going out. In America, grade point average at high school predicts 90% of the variance of grade point average at university. So your high school leaving grade is almost all you need to know. In the, in the UK, it's a much less good predictor, but nevertheless, a lot of the difference in student performance depends on how good quality students you get in. But it, interestingly, it does not predict how much they learn. The difference between coming in and going out is not predicted by A-level schools. Interesting. The institutions that have the, that are most selective about students, that get those extra points on all those league tables, do not use pedagogies that are known to be more effective. They do not have students that are more engaged. I'll come back to engagement as an issue. So there's a complete disjuncture between evidence trying to believe that how good your students are means you're a good university. It tells you almost nothing about how much you're going to learn while you're at university. Now it might do if learning was a lot more social, so the fact that the other students around you were much better students. That would probably make a difference, except that in the UK almost all learning is solitary and competitive, so you throw all that potential advantage away straight away. Does research predict, predict learning? No, not at all. There have been endless studies um, of trying, trying to connect any measure of research with any measure of teaching quality or learning engagement you can think of. Nobody's ever found a, a relationship. One study that reviewed 80 different research studies on this described research and teaching as unrelated <coughs> domains of endeavour. So again, rank, rankings that say they're good at research so they must be good at teaching, nonsense. It doesn't tell you anything at all about student engagement or student learning gains. It does tell you about student performance because the research will give you a reputation, the reputation will enable you to select students and that's what will get you the performance. But it's nothing to do with the educational process completely. It's a presage thing. Who does the teaching? Now that really does predict performance. In America, something like 55% of all teaching 
is now undertaken by what they call adjunct faculty. These are people who are not tenured academics. In fact, they have 10 month contracts to avoid all employment legislation. They don't have an office. They probably have a portfolio career in four or five institutions in the same city where they live. More than half of all teaching in higher education in America is like that. But we're moving towards that in the UK as well. In America, it's clear that the proportion of teaching done by adjunct faculty is a really good predictor of student failure, dropout, and lack of engagement. It's a real problem. In the Russell Group universities, more than half of all small group teaching is undertaken by graduate teaching assistants. I bet they didn't know that when they read the prospectus. So it matters who does the teaching. It isn't that the adjunct faculty are lousy human beings or lousy teachers. That's not, not what this is about at all. We'll come, we'll gradually understand why this is problematic. They may be very committed to good teachers and it's still not work. Reputation is hopeless. It tells you nothing at all about the pedagogic methods people use or how effective they are, how engaged students are about learning games. In America, there's endless surveys where they write round to deans and provosts and presidents and ask them about reputation. And they all come up with the same answer every year. It's entirely predicted on um, income and research prowess. The same thing happened in the UK with teaching quality assessment. Who here experienced the teaching quality assessment? A good sprinkling of you. It was nonsense. <laughs> teaching quality assessment gave degree programs a score out of 24. Those scores, it turned out, could be entirely predicted on the basis of research pro um, performance or income together or separately. You actually didn't need to know anything at all about what people did to actually teach to produce exactly the same score. In other words, the people making teaching quality assessment judgments, peers at other institutions, were completely swayed by reputation. And reputation tells you nothing about pedagogic processes. I'm sure you're all glad to hear this, but it's all true. So we need to look at what does make a difference. And of course, that's what you actually do with your money, do with your students, do with your teachers once you've got them. So these are process variables. Cohort size, how many students have been enrolled on a degree program. Class size, how many people are in the room, predicts negatively student performance to an extraordinary extent. To an extraordinary extent. Um, close contact with teachers has been shown to make a difference. Close contact is a somewhat nebulous variable, but for example, being able, getting your essay back with feedback on and being able to go to your teacher and say, what did you mean by this? I don't understand what I should be doing next time. That's close contact. The Oxford tutorial is close contact. Close contact is really is something resembling oral interaction with your teacher. That is a good predictor of learning gains. <coughs> You can avoid some of these problems. There are ways round negative class size effects, though not many people exploit them. But the first, so large is not beautiful, is the first thing. It's not class contact hours. There is no relationship between how many class contact hours students have and how much they learn in three years at university. The two institutions of the top NSS schools are the Open University with almost no class contact at all and Oxford that has less class contact than any other face-to-face -face institution. The places with large numbers of class contact are well down the rankings. If you drop below about six, seven, eight hours a week altogether, you start running into problems due to total lack of engagement. But there was a lovely study in Holland that looked at student, total student learning effort. So that's class contact hours plus independent study and related it to how much class contact there was. And basically, as class contact hours went up, independent study hours went down, so everybody studied the same length of week. So students were committed to study in Holland. They were committed to study between about 37 and 42 hours a week, depending on the subject. And they studied that regardless of how many class contact hours they were. It was completely independent, except right at the very bottom end, where there was hardly any teaching at all. Then student learning effort went down. The average in Britain is not much over 20 hours a week, so we do have a problem here. But increasing class contact hours is not the way to solve this problem. 
It's what you do out of glass contact that matters. And if I was in charge of quality of institution, the first thing I would do is focus on student learning hours. One of the American seven principles of good practice in undergraduate education, which is about the best list of empirical-based principles, one of the principles is good practice emphasizes time on task. The primary responsibility of a teacher is to design their course in such a way that students spend enough time on the right things and the most important evaluation question of a course is how much time did students spend and what did they spend it on? That's, when, that's what predicts learning. It's not what you're doing, it's what they're doing. Quality of teaching matters. There are, although they're not used in Britain, questionnaires which are valid measures of teaching quality that predict how much students learn, how hard they work, how much they read, whether they'll carry on choosing subjects by the same teacher or in the same subject area, all kinds of sensible measures of outcomes that would convince you to be predicted by a simple, very simple questionnaire about teaching quality. Most of us in Britain invent our own questionnaires and they're unreliable and invalid, but there are valid questionnaires. Scores on those questionnaires go up if you train teachers. The kind of postgraduate certificates of teaching we have in Britain are very successful in improving teaching quality measured by that instrument. The students who have teachers who've been trained change the way they study. The teachers are more sophisticated in terms of their understanding and decision making. Almost whatever measure you can think of, training works. So that's a good thing to know about. Um, accreditation, there's no evidence that accreditation works. And I'm highly skeptical about the Higher Education Academy giving people accreditation on filling some bits of paper and then submitting them. It's the course process that does the changes to teachers, not filling in a document. Um, we couldn't, when I did, was doing research in this area, we couldn't find a course that made any difference that was less than about 120 hours long. That meant, and that meant talking you know, about class contact, if you like. You know, it's size in terms of meeting, talking, and those kinds of things. The, the quality of the research environment doesn't make any difference. It does at graduate level. And when, I, when I was at Oxford, you could predict time to completion of PhD by measures of the richness of the research environment. But those same measures of richness of the research environment predicted nothing at all about undergraduate um, behavior, performance, learning, gained anything. Had nothing to do with it. What consequences do these variables have? Well, they change the extent to which students take a deep or surface approach. Surface approach is trying to memorize or reproduce. The deep approach is trying to understand, link things together, build on what you already know. Research on that was going on based on Sweden 20 years before the Americans started getting interested in student engagement. The National Survey of Student Engagement is now used by 800 universities in America alone. It's a wonderful instrument. The scale on the National Survey of Student Engagement that best predicts learning gains is called Deep Approach. It's about the extent to which students are trying to make sense of things. And Deep Approach is predicted by these other variables. American engagement, what predicts engagement that then predicts learning gains, close contact, high and clear expectations. This is an interesting one. I think the QAA are obsessed by clear expectations and they've completely forgotten about high. The thing that engages students is challenge. And I think from my work on assessment and students understanding what they're supposed to be doing and putting learning hours in because they're engaged with the assessment in, what gets the hours being put in is being shown, say, if you work really hard on this course, then you'll be able to produce a project report that looks as impressive as this one. That's a clear and high expectation. If you show them a set of criteria in detail, describe your tasks, from the qualitative studies I've seen, it actually lowers and narrows student effort. They can see what they don't have to do in order to do fairly well on the course. Clarity of expectations comes from things like um, Fine art courses, final degree program. You can see just the wonderful work that students can produce at the end of three years. If a first year student saw that, that's a clear and high expectation. I don't think what the QAA asks us to do conveys high at all. It's a real problem. It's high expectations to get engagement. Good, quick feedback. 
loads of evidence about this. The quick is just as important as good. There seems to be plenty of evidence that quick and dirty feedback works much better than slow and perfect feedback, for example. So some of the work I've been doing on improving assessment and feedback scores on the NSS, the solutions involve things like immediate oral feedback into a digital mic tape recorder, email the file straight to the student, the mark comes back three weeks later. You separate the feedback from the mark, the feedback comes back within 24 hours. Huge impact. It can be quick and dirty. You can even peer feedback that's wrong works better than tutor feedback that's right that happens three weeks later. <laughs> it it much different than that. Student feedback that's wrong makes you think. That's what produces the learning. It's the reflection that's prompted by the feedback. And there's lots of ways of making that happen. Class discussions of model answers makes that happen. All kinds of things. The benefit from feedback is the thinking that goes on and it has to happen quickly and it has to happen in time to help you do the next thing you're doing. So there have to be sequences that are joined up. If your assessment regulations and modularity makes it extremely difficult for you to join things up, then you have to use tricks like they use at Worcester where feedback forms have a tear-off slip at the bottom and it's called developmental priorities. But what it really means is the tutor writes, next time you encounter an assignment of this kind, whether it's next semester or next year, you need to pay more attention to the following things. And students tear it off and stick it on the front of the next assignment they do of that kind. And the students reminded, given that this is a group project report or a presentation or whatever kind of assignment it is, that that's what they ought to pay more attention to. And the marker is also queued in that those are the things they should be paying attention to. That makes feedback feed forward. It's the connection between sequences that does the job. The idea you can make feedback work with isolated examples with three-week turnaround, you might as well not bother. It's a waste of your time and effort. Active and collaborative learning. Almost anything that gets students working together works better than students working alone. And time on task. So the measures that all, we ought to be able to use, these three, turn out, I won't say much about this, turn out to be useless because they're totally unreliable and uninterpretable. And three years ago, the Select Committee of Parliament expressed no confidence in standards in higher education, not limited confidence, no confidence. In other words, they believed that the quality regime that the QAA imposes on institutions is organisationally incapable of maintaining standards. Interesting observation. So degree classifications are all over the place and you can't make any sense of them at all. Retention, well, it depends what students you've got and whether there's high employability in your city and your mix of subjects and it's largely outside of institutions' control. There's all kinds of posters out there about you trying to improve employability and you can at the margins, but this is a rigged market. It's a rigged market. You're really up against it improving the employability of your students. So these things you can't use, so you have to look at process variables. There are meta-analyses in educational research, as there are in medicine, where you take all the studies around the world that have ever been done on a particular intervention to see whether, on average, that intervention works. For example, um, French higher education is based on a model where if you fail your exam, you reset the course. You can't progress until you pass. And there's tremendously strong evidence from all around the world that this has negative effects on student learning. The French are really good at imposing on everybody things that are known to make things worse. This spectacular <laughs> <laughs> analysis will take all the studies on a particular intervention, like holding people back if they fail an exam, and see whether, on average, what effect it does. You can then look at all the meta-analyses. We're talking about meta, meta-analyses. All the different studies to see which interventions are at the top of the list in terms of size of impact and which ones at the bottom of the list regularly have negative impacts. The ones right at the top are all about changing students. The leverage is by getting students to behave differently as learners. That's where the leverage is. How do you get them to spend more time on task is at the top of the list. Metacognitive awareness and control. That's about 
sophisticated students can talk to you about why they do this here, why they do that there, why this works for me in this circumstance, why I take notes like that and write essays like this. They can talk all about it. They're flexible. They have a repertoire. They can choose between their repertoire because they recognize different demands in context. <coughs> you can predict almost nothing about their study skills, the de detailed way they actually do it, because that's so highly idiosyncratic. The only the difference you can spot is metacognitive awareness and control. Students being reflective and sophisticated about making decisions about how they do things. Unsophisticated students, I used to be a study counsellor years ago, and I would have student services would refer to me students who were failing. They they go along and to student services and say, I think, and I'm thinking of dropping out. Counsel me. And they say, I don't think this is an emotional problem, it's because you don't know how to study. And they would be packed off to Graham Gibbs. And I would have a caseload of students I would see for half an hour once a week, about, supposedly about study skills. And I didn't know what their problems were. So I'd say, if you've got a book in your bag you're supposed to be reading at the moment, and they get it out, said, open it where you last read. And I'd leave them reading for 10 minutes. And then I'd say, OK, what were you doing? And they'd say, what do you mean, what was I doing? And I said, well, when you were reading, what was going on? And they said, well, when I got to the bottom of the page, I turned over. What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> and I think they could tell me nothing at all about how they went about reading. Now, you, you read in all kinds of different ways in different contexts. Metacognitive awareness and control is about that. It's the difference between students who can be reflective and can't. So anything you can do that develops that will make a difference. Self-efficacy. Students' belief that they're capable of passing. The Open University improves the self-efficacy of science students. They used to have eight assignments, and the students would drop out after the first one. They'd say, I've only got four out of ten. I'm clearly not, I haven't got a science head. I'm not capable of this. I'm going to drop out. They replaced it with a system where the first four were formative only in a break in difficulty, with the tutor's feedback being almost entirely about encouragement. Not only did they have much better retention, but students performed better in the exam at the end. So stopping using summative assessments improves student self-efficacy. It makes a difference who they are, how sophisticated they are. That's next, next list. Change the students, change the teachers. Move from solitary to social learning is the next bunch of things in this grade of impacts. Then change the curriculum, that's further down. And the things there to do with coherence, so modularity, is the enemy of coherence. It's really difficult to get degree programs to work properly if they're modular. It's a, it's a very bold thing to say. Um, Liverpool Hope University have abandoned modularity entirely and students now do three courses, a first year course, a second year course, and a third year course. Interesting. Lots of the things that enable you to make degree programs work, you can't do because of the modular course regulations you're working within. It's just, um, nationally, people are fleeing from modularity because they can't improve their NSS scores because they're about programs. They can have lots of good modules and they don't add up to good programs. Coventry use the NSS at module level. They've rewritten it so it works at modular level. And they've got much better scores on the NSS at module level than they have for their degree programs. And other people have found the same thing. That the whole is less than the sum of the parts, and the only way to get good NSS scores for programs is to work on programs. Some of the most difficult situations I've been in to try to improve them is where I've got a room full, a course team full of committed, innovative teachers doing all kinds of stuff all over the place. And you think, well, I don't know where to start because it's in totally incoherent. The assessment's incoherent. There's no progression, there's no planning. Everybody's doing wonderful, interesting, exciting things. From the student's perspective, it's just a bloody mess. And I'm in trouble on time. One of the things that I've learned more and more about, I'm a psychologist by background, and I've had to learn more sociology to understand what goes on. One of the fascinating things about um, NSS scores 
There's, there's more variation between subjects within institutions than there is between institutions. In other words, despite all the characteristics of Sheffield Hallam and your kinds of students and your particular quality assurance regime, there is more variation in NSOs between subjects here than there is between Sheffield Hallam and other universities in the country. So there's something going on at departmental or subject level that's really important, despite all the other stuff that's going on. I visited the University of Plymouth. Plymouth have got more national teaching fellows than anybody else. They've had teaching awards for 20 years. They've had training of teachers for 25 years. They've had a teaching conference like this for 15 years. They've had funds on innovation. They won more centres of excellence in teaching and learning than everybody else. 16 million quids worth of centres of excellence in teaching and learning. And their NSS scores are going down and they are plummeting down the rankings almost all of their amazing teaching enhancement mechanisms, which the QAA are very impressed by, focus on individual teachers and module level innovation, and they do not make degree programs work. They have nothing at Plymouth that operates at program level to improve things. There's no training for program leaders. Most of the evaluation is module level evaluation. There's nothing in their quality insurance system that expects assessment regimes to be coherent so that students progress in sophistication as they move through three years. Anything you can think of that would be about to make programs work, they don't have. But up until recently, until NSS scores came out, Plymouth were considered a model for quality enhancement. But at program level, it doesn't work. Communities of practice. I have to be selective in my anecdotes here. This, but this is a lovely one. <coughs> I worked at Oxford Poly for years and years. I got called back at a point where the QAA did an audit and they said, just like last time we came and the time before that, there are huge differences between subjects in average marks. So Egyptology, the average mark 68 and in electrical engineering it's always 49 and it's always been like that you've obviously got a standards problem you have a modular system it shouldn't be easier for people to get good degrees in one subject than another you've got a standards problem and the vice chancellor hired a sophisticated multivariate analysis statistician to raid their management information database to see whether it was students a level scores class contact hours type of assessment system anything they could find that had any data on at all, put it, you know, stir it with statistical methods, they could find nothing at all that would predict what was going on. They were about to throw their hands up in horror. And there was a visiting academic from Oslo, who was an ethnographer, called Anton Havnes, and he just said, tell me which subjects have got high average marks and which ones have consistently got low average marks, and he disappeared for about two and a half months. And it turns out he just hung out with them. And he came back and he said, I know what's going on. And there was this pregnant pause. And he said, in the subject areas with high academic marks, the academics have curry together on Fridays. <laughs> Almost the only thing you can predict in the American literature on student engagement, where there are departments that have exceptionally good student engagement, but none of the other variables will give you a clue why it's as good. You go in and try to find out what's going on, and what happens is that the teachers talk to each other. It's as sophisticated as that. At Coventry, they've been quite good at improving their NSS scores. They have a system where every subject every year, there has to be two course team days. One of them they can do what they like with, the other one is to discuss NSS schools. And they have to talk to each other for a day twice a year as a team. I've been into course teams of virtual subjects. I've been into American studies an institution that was invented. There were some English literature people that happened to know about American literature. There were some historians that happened to know about American history. You can imagine that somebody said, hey, we could have another 40 students a year if we invented American studies bolting together. There's no place, there's no community, the academics only go to meetings back in English literature or history, that, and the course team doesn't really exist. There's no social community at all. Several of the posters out here are about community. There is 
building very strong evidence that community matters. At the University of Oslo, the main teaching prize each year is for the best learning environment. It could be the first year of the medical programme or something like that. In Finland, the big national prize for teaching is for the best department. At Utrecht, they give four honorary doctorates a year, and then there's the prize that gets everybody on their feet and cheering in the Dom, the cathedral where the Treaty of Utrecht was signed, and that's the Leadership of Teaching Prize. The person who's made most difference to a subject by the way they've led their colleagues in changing the way it's taught. What's missing in the UK is, is functioning course teams and leadership of teaching. It's missing from promotion criteria, rewards, it's miss, missing from job specification, it's missing from training systems. There's a lack of focus on how you get sophisticated in developing programs. I'm just going to pick out one example. I can't talk about all this. There's some very clever use of data to improve things. One I want to pick out is Winchester, where I'm working one day a week. They use a data-driven assessment improvement program to improve NSS scores for assessment and feedback, which are the lowest of all on the NSS. And they're the ones that people have most trouble improving. And it's driven by data. And by doing it, the first degree program at Winchester did that in um, one year, one year. The average score on question seven at Edinburgh is 39%. They're ranked what, third for research. And one stu wonderful student. The whole of the University of Winchester got better on that in over three years, while various people were adopting this data-driven approach to improving, which gets course teams to sit down and look at evidence about assessment as a course team and make course team level decisions. It's got nothing to do with innovation at module level. The other stuff, and this includes about this, last thing I'll say. There's a sudden flurry in realising that students are very, can be very powerful levers for change that improves NSS scores very quickly. Those institutions in Britain that have got very good student engagement mechanisms, and here I'm not talking about student engagement with their studies, I mean student engagement with quality enhancement. Those that have got well-established functioning systems, uh, they're improving their NSS scores about three times as fast as the institutions who have not got such mechanisms. One example, Exeter, they spent years and years spending millions on WebCT and trying to get people to use all the bells and whistles on virtual learning environments, conferences, innovation funds, training. Still hardly anybody used it, and they knew from data, because they're very good with data, Exeter, that they were way behind European benchmarks to the extent of using technology in teaching and learning. They said from the centre, we'll stop spending all our money on WebCT, we'll adopt Moodle, which is free, and the money we save, we're going to give to you as a department, and you can hire a graduating student of your own choice to come back next year and work with you on this. We will train them up on how to use Moodle, and they will work with you one-to-one -one and with your course team about how to use Moodle. And the students train the teachers how to use it. And in one year, every single <coughs> course across the whole of Exeter used about 14 different characteristics of Moodle in one year by students being the <coughs> trainers of the teachers. That's the most spectacular example I know about. At Winchester, we've just adopted a system where every <coughs> degree program has got money, this has driven the students' union have got the money to hire a student to be a researcher on that degree program. The student rep will organise students in such a way that they identify the issue that they most want attention paid to, and then the student will do some kind of evaluation study around that issue and feed it into the annual course review process so the course team pay attention to it. And the funding is 600 quid per student for about 100 hours of their effort. If they want to do a module, well, they'll get 15 credits for doing educational research, they can. If they want to build their employability certificate for the Winchester Passport around it, they can do that. 
well, they may just take the money to have students drive the issues that course teams pay attention to. There are mechanisms like this being developed all over the country. Most of them are small scale, it's a few students, a few courses. In a few institutions, it's the whole institution at once. At Coventry, students will walk into the lot your lecture theatre, administer a questionnaire, walk out again, analyse the data and then tell the course course team what they should be paying attention to. The students run the evaluation system. Those are the ones where there's the big lead route. Well, I'm going to have to stop. I'm yeah, you are. Um, <laughs> that's probably the best thing, so I will leave it there. Ram, thank you so much.